Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming on this uh, frigid day out there. Um, oh, we really appreciate it. I made the mistake of walking a mile and a half to work this morning. I won't make that mistake again. Uh, the, uh, my name is Brian Fishman. I'm a counterterrorism research fellow here at the New America Foundation. Uh, and I really have the pleasure today of, of hosting Nellie LaHood, who is an associate up at the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, my former employer and really sort of a, a unique and special place. Uh, Nellie's got her PhD uh, at the Australian National University uh, and prior to moving to West Point was teaching at Goucher University in Baltimore. And she's really written what I think is a unique book about the jihadi movement today putting it in a historical context and giving us some uh, really innovative and new tools, intellectual tools, to think about this movement uh, historically and its strengths and weaknesses. So I'm going to uh, do my best uh, generally to get out of the way. Nellie will talk for a few minutes, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, we will have a, a mic back there, so if you ask a question, please wait for the mic because we are webcasting, and there are, so there are other people that are going to watch this that are not in the room. I don't think I told Nellie that. Uh, and uh, and beyond that, uh, I'll turn it over to Nellie. Thanks. Well, thank you all for uh, your interest and, and, and for showing up today on this very cold day. I'm delighted by your presence. And a particular thank you to Brian for extending this invitation to me and, and giving me the opportunity to speak about the book to such a distinguished audience. Um, I'm going to limit my presentation to two broad themes that drove my research in the book. And I'd be happy to discuss specifics um, in the Q&A. The first issue um, that I was interested in, 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 in doing when I started working on the book is to understand the doctrinal paradigm that shapes jihadi ideology and the implications of espousing an ideology that is exclusively defined by religious doctrines. In other words, I was asking myself, can jihadis sustain themselves on religious doctrines alone? And will their ideology allow them to achieve their objectives? But I must note that I wasn't interested in exploring jihadi ideology through the prism of the Islamic faith. I'm a student of both classical and contemporary Islamic political thought, and I was quite dissatisfied with some of the literature that sought to, play to place an emphasis on Islam as a faith, as a way of understanding jihadism. Of course, having an understanding of Islam as a faith and of the Islamic tradition is important, indeed essential, but I think that the emphasis should be on understanding the jihadis' objectives and their internal dynamics in order to, appreci to appreciate which specific components uh, they, they wanted to appropriate from the Islamic tradition. The other issue that I was interested in exploring concerned the similarities and differences between the jihadis and the Kharijites. The Kharijites are a 7th century anti-establishment group, and my interest in exploring this aspect was sparked by parallels um, that were drawn between the two groups by many commentators and analysts, and essentially claiming that the jihadis are the heirs of the Kharijites. Who is this relatively obscure 7th century group and why should it matter today? I'd be happy to bore you to death about the history of the Kharijites in the Q&A. Um, but I shall stick to some basic information about them for the purpose of this presentation. The Kharijites emerged in the 7th century and they were characterized by a rigid understanding of the Quran. Scholars of early Islam used the term scripturalist to describe their literal approach to the Quran and their narrow worldview. Their debut as a distinct group set them up that as a distinct group that set them apart from other Muslims was in 661 when they rebelled against and then assassinated the fourth caliph Ali bin Abi Talib, who was also the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. The Kharijites believed that he was not faithful to the letter of the Quran in governing the Muslim community. They also identified with those who assassinated his predecessor, the third Caliph Uthman, on account that he was not governing according to the justice of the Quran. Their activism was not limited to assassinating these two Caliphs. They mounted rebellions against the Islamic establishment in several regions of Arabia. 
deep down, the Harishites, since I worked a lot on them and, and became sympathetic, um, they were idealist in their vision of Islam and individualist in terms of the way they believed it should be applied. They understood Islam as a covenant between each Muslim and God. Upon accepting Islam, the believer is required to carry out God's law to the letter, as revealed in God's book, in return for a place in paradise. God has no special favorites, they said. Everyone is equal in his eyes. They believed in a strictly egalitarian status amongst believers, an egalitarianism that transcended political and social hierarchies. The Quran, they believed, was God's revelations, and I'm quoting them, to white and black, Arab and non-Arab, freeman and slave, male and female, end of quotation. In this respect, they were more egalitarian than their contemporary Muslims, who, as soon as Muhammad, the founder of the faith, died, moved to accommodate the teachings of Islam to the existing social hierarchies of Arabia, privileging Arabs over others and making the leadership of the Islamic community as a prerogative of Quraysh, the tribe of Muhammad. The Kharijites' noble principles, however, were undermined by the manner in which they went about applying them. They took it upon themselves to purify the early community of Muslims from any perceived signs of unbelief, freely leveling takfir against fellow Muslims whom they deemed to have shirked their commitment to God's law. In their minds, once they decided that a fellow Muslim was de deserving of the label kafir or unbeliever, they deemed it lawful to kill him. And that is what tak why takfir is a dangerous pronouncement. And that is why medieval and contemporary mainstream religious scholars caution against making the pronouncement of, of takfir. Essentially, it's when a Muslim declare other fellow Muslims to be unbeliever, which makes it lawful for him to shed his blood. Before long, the Harijites turned against each other. Whenever a disagreement amongst themselves arose over the, the, the meaning of a Quranic dictum, their inability to compromise led them to declare even fellow Harijites to be unbelievers and proceed to fight them. The consequences of takfir were detrimental to their internal cohesion. Thus, despite being renowned as formidable fighters, so much so that they were on the verge of taking over all of Arabia, they self-destructed. In the collective religious memory of Muslims, the Harijites evoke a combination of a predisposition to rebel and a readiness to resort to violence, two key ingredients that cause internal fighting or fitna among Muslims and therefore endanger the faith. They are perceived by Muslims as dissenters from the community. Their very name in Arabic, Khawarij, is derived from the same name as the, as the same name word, uh, uh, word denoting the act of rebellion. Traditional Muslim accounts don't look to emphasize their idealistic uh, um, uh, uh, component, but they tend to stress that the Kharijites activities are linked to bloodshed and violence committed against fellow Muslims. And mainstream religious authorities have denounced them for casually and excessively resorting to takfir. Now, how are the Kharijites related to the jihadis? To start with, the jihadis are not the historical descendants of the Kharijites. And for the most part, the parallels drawn between the jihadis and the Kharijites lack a coherent reasoning. The jihadis universally reject any intellectual or historical affiliation with the Kharijites. And Osama bin Laden stated categorically, and I'm quoting him, we have nothing to do with such a school of thought when he refers to the Kharijites. And the militant Kharijites did not survive to say for themselves whether the jihadis represent their views or not. When I began reading the jihadis' response to the dr parallels drawn between them and the Kharijites, I found the jihadis to be making a more plausible case than their accusers. The differences between them and the Kharijites are too evident for the parallels to make sense. A couple of differences should explain the gulf between the two groups. The caliphs against whom the Kharijites fought, Uthman and Ali, and assassinated, are considered by the jihadis to be, to be their righteous predecessors or a Salaf as Salih. While the Kharijites deemed these two caliphs to have violated God's law, and that's why they rebelled against them and assassinated them, the jihadis hold them as exceptional examples in leadership and that they ought to be emulated as well. But on a more profound level, 
The Islam the Kharijites contested is the Islam the jihadis are trying to rehabilitate. That is, the Kharijites contested the nascent Islam that was rapidly growing into an empire, while the jihadis are contesting an Islam that is shrinking into nation states. Indeed, in the jihadis' case, true Islam is perceived to be tied to rehabilitating the empire or the caliphate. In view of these differences, why then should some analysts and commentators paint the jihadis as the heirs of the Kharijites? In many instances, one finds that the parallels drawn between the two groups are not really neutral. They are driven by the aim of discrediting the Islamic credentials of the jihadis. Since the Kharijites are already discredited in the eyes of mainstream Muslims, commentators with an agenda deduce that a comparison between the Kharijites and the jihadis might lead to discrediting the Islamic credibility of the jihadis. The more I learned about both the Kharijites and the jihadis, the more I realized that the commentators were onto something when they compared the two groups, but for reasons that were different from the ones that they postulated. There is a parallel to be made, but not because it serves to discredit the Islamic credibility of the jihadis, but because the Kharijites shed light on the path of groups that are defined exclusively by religious doctrines, how such groups mutate and eventually disappear. I'm going to come back to this aspect later in my talk to, dis to discuss how the history of the militant Kharijites can shed light on the future or fate of the jihadis. For now, let me turn to the jihadis and share with you some of the findings I think we should to my mind, the way I think we should be understanding their ideology. To begin with, it is critical to realize that for the jihadis, Islam is not simply about piety and spirituality. In fact, Islamic sources of piety and ways of spirituality are marginal in the jihadi worldview. Islam provides the jihadis with an alternative source of legitimacy to the nation state. And the interna as, as well as the international world order as we know it. Central to the jihadi worldview is a rejection of the legitimacy of the nation state and all other political and international norms. This sets the jihadis apart, not just from mainstream Muslims who adhere to Islam as a faith and see themselves to be citizens of their respective states, but it also sets them apart from Islamist groups like Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood and others who share with the jihadis the belief that Islamic teachings of social justice are the solution to the problems Muslims face today. But these Islamists operate within the political processes of the nation state. They form political groups and parties and often advance their agenda through contesting elections. By contrast, the jihadis reject the world order of nation states, believing it to be a continuation of imperialism through other means. Further, the jihadis are adamant that nothing should take precedence over jihad. For now, Islam and jihad are the same, they say. I devote a chapter in the book discussing how the Islamists pursued, opted to pursue a democratic path, how they rationalized it on the basis of Islamic teachings, and why the jihadis have opted for a jihadocracy, if you like, how they rationalized it and also defended it on the basis of Islamic teachings. As far as the jihadis are concerned, the positive laws that define the world order of today serve the interests of the West at the expense of Muslims and their interests. Muslim regimes, they say, are complicit in this. They are corrupt and are happy to benefit and profit at the expense of their populace. Muslims, the jihadis hold, are faced with two intertwined enemies, their own regimes that do not govern according to the justice that Islam preaches, and some Western countries led by the United States and its allies that lend support to these regimes. The only remedy that would bring justice and accountability to all the jihadis hold is when God's law reigns supreme. Until then, jihad is the only path towards achieving this goal. This rationalization on the part of the jihadis is significant. It goes to show that though the jihadis are anti-political, in the sense that they are anti-political process, they are not apolitical. And so the origin of jihadism lies not in the Islamic faith, but in the intractable political problems that have led some Muslims to assume that only a paradigm that is 
defined exclusively by religious doctrines, with jihad at its core, could address the injustices they face today. The political grievances the jihadis express provide an, a window into the idealism they project and how Islam nourishes this idealism. They present themselves to be on the side of the underdog, always, on the side of the Palestinians, the Kashmiris, the Iraqis, the Somalis, etc. But the injustices these Muslims endure is an assault on God's law and his justice. Thus, the jihadis jihad is not about people or states or defending political parties or leaders. Rather, their loyalty to God alone is, is their loyalty is only to God and to his justice, and their jihad is waged in his service. God, therefore, is the focal point of their, if you like, social contract. They don't call it social contract, but they speak of other terms like wala and bara. Wala refers to the loyalty jihadis must have towards those who, like them, love God's friends and hate his enemies. Bara refers to those from whom the jihadis must dissociate, because these people have compromised God's law by putting worldly concerns ahead of divine commands. In simple terms, the paradigm of Wala and Bara serves to designate those who are in and separate them from those who are out. But as we shall see, this paradigm does not simply constitute the jihadi's social contract, it is also a global contract. Since the loyalty the jihadis must have towards one another is a shared creed, the, base, the, par the, paradigm, uh, um, the paradigm of wala and bara allows the jihadis to cast their net globally. Everyone who shares the creed is invited to join in and converts are welcome. This explains how Kenyans, Saudis, Afghans, Pakistanis, Americans, Australians, Yemenis, and more can forge common bonds that supplant national bonds. It is cosmopolitanism in action. In principle, the process of becoming a jihadi is by far simpler than acquiring a citizenship of a state or even of a green card, as I, as I found out myself. Beyond formulating an inclusive paradigm open to people irrespective of their color, social status, origin, language, and gender, jihadi ideologues have empowered the jihadi masses to interpret religion and jihad on an individual basis. This is not to say that the jihadis do not have their religious scholars. They do. And it is not to say that they don't believe in having a ruler. They do. But until a legitimate ruler is established, the jihadis do not want to centralize the interpretation of Islam, and especially of jihad, in the hands of the few who might easily be corrupted by the, by the political esta establishment. They are distrustful of any religious scholar who is not supportive of jihad. In one interview, uh, um, when Osama bin Laden was told that many religious scholars have denounced the attacks of 9-11, he swiftly responded, well, no official scholars, juridical decree have any value as far as I'm concerned. And to this end, I discuss in the book why jihadi recantations are not the great hope that counterterrorism experts believe, and I'd be happy to, to, to talk about that in the Q&A. But how do jihadis translate their idealism into practice? The engine that drives jihadism is their belief that jihad today is the individual duty of every Muslim. The legal term is fardain. Jihadi ideologues stress that they are engaged in defensive warfare, defensive jihad, and draw on the medieval defensive doctrine of jihad to argue that jihad today is the individual duty of every Muslim. Like medieval Christian jurists, Muslim medieval jurists who developed the de this defensive doctrine of jihad envisaged that it would only apply under extraordinary circumstances when Muslims are under attack in their own territory and therefore did not have the luxury to seek anyone's permission to defend themselves. Therefore, the classical jurists made it lawful for Muslims to take up jihad on their own initiative without awaiting the orders or permissions of any religious, parental, political, or even spousal authorities. Shihadi ideologues have molded this classical legal doctrine of warfare into a contemporary global military program. They believe that 
today's jihad is not simply to repel a territorial attack. Instead, jihad is against both their own regimes, whom they call the near enemy, that do not govern according to the justice that Islam preaches, and against the West, whom they call the far enemy, that supports corrupt and oppressive Muslim regimes. In essence, this doctrine of defensive jihad allows the jihadis to transcend the authority of the state, and it also undermines any form of hierarchy or authority that may stand between the militant believer and jihad. What we have then is an ideology that is premised on a sense of idealism, on a sense of individualism, and the right of the individual to resort to violence in defense of his religious doctrines. While this ideology is in many ways appealing and responsible for the international profile the jihadis enjoy, ironically, it has also been the source of much of the problems and infighting that have weakened the jihadis. Not all the jihadis are strategic in their vision, and not all of them are driven solely by a sense of political injustice. Some jihadis are driven to wage jihad by a, desire, by a desire to preserve doctrinal purity. Accordingly, they are more prone to target Muslims, including jihadis, when they perceive them to have shirked their commitment to God's law. Such doctrinally driven and narrow-minded jihadis are unwittingly empowered by jihadi strategists who downplay the value of religious education, lest it forestalls the Muslim youth's enthusiasm for militancy. In the words of Abu Musab al-Suri, the only prerequisite is to embrace Islam, then fight. But this ambivalent approach to structured religious education made jihadism a magnet for many who embrace jihad before learning how to pray. To these nouveau Muslims, Religious doctrine is an end in and of itself. For them, the emphasis is not so much on loyalty or wala to fellow Muslims. They are more preoccupied with those from whom they must dissociate or bara. And some jihadis take this dissociation further, declaring that those who do not share their beliefs to be unbelievers. As I noted, this is a pronouncement that is called takfir, and for some, it carries the license to shed the blood of fellow Muslims. What are the consequences of takfir for the future of jihadism? Looking back at the fate of the Kharijites here is constructive. As I noted earlier, the differences between the Kharijites and the jihadis cannot be ignored. And though the jihadis start from very different premises, from those of the Kharijites, they nevertheless faced the same dilemma that the Kharijites faced in the 7th century. Namely, what is the religious obligation of the believers when they perceive their faith to be undermined by their own rulers and their fellow Muslims? Do believers have an obligation to obey their rulers for the sake of maintaining the unity of the community? Or is it their obligation to rebel against their rulers? <coughs> The jihadis' response to this dilemma is virtually identical to that of the Kharijites, namely that they would not compromise their religious principles. Their duty, they believe, is first and foremost to God, not the community. And the Muslim community that does not realize this important obligation is inflicted with an illness and the jihadis have a duty to heal it. Like the Kharijites, the jihadis have opted to rebel, thereby rejecting modern institutionalism as defined by the nation state in order to reclaim a distant institutional Islam that they believe was founded on justice. Classical or medieval Muslims were of the view that 60 years of enduring an unjust ruler are still better than living one day without one in a state of anarchy. The jihadis, like the Kharijites, think otherwise. Since jihadi ideologues and leaders have decentralized not just Islam, but also jihad, they have unwittingly decentralized the fate and strategy of jihadism. When and how to resort to jihad to defend religious principles and who is a true jihadi and who is a kafir, unbeliever, can be decided by any jihadi as he sees fit. This naturally makes jihadism more conducive to doctrinally driven trends that resort to dakfir. And I discuss in the book how some takfiri trends were detrimental to jihadism in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
And these Takfiri trends are a serious liability to the jihadis and could ultimately bring about the, demands, the demise of jihadism as Takfir did to the Kharijites. To, to return to the broader theme of comparing the Kharijites with the jihadis, it's important to realize that when we draw parallels between the two groups, we are not looking at a lack of Islamic credibility here. Instead, we are dealing with exceptional Islamic exceptionalism, a surplus of Islam, if you like. Their idealist of vision of Islam is a revolutionary creed, but not one that could inspire a mode of governance. They want to pursue God's path, but that path is not for pedestrians. What the Harijites show, by way of comparison, is that religious groups defined by scriptural rigidity are more often defeated by their own quibbles and internal disputes over doct doctrine rather than by the swords of their enemies. The only Kharijites who continue to exist and make up less than 1% of Muslims today are a group called Ibadiyya. They survived because they reneged on their rigid religious views and adopted a quietus or a peaceful and cooperative approach with fellow Muslims and others. I'm about to conclude and when I share my findings, uh, um, I'm often asked, what do you think we should do? And I'm always reluctant to provide policy advice because I don't believe that I'm qualified to do so. But I don't believe that a DC audience would allow me to get away with it. So I've come prepared. Given that I work at West Point now, it is only fitting that I should refer to the wisdom of Al-Muhallab, the seventh century military commander who was in charge of fighting the Kharijites. When his governor Al-Hajjaj ordered him to pursue fighting the Kharijites, Al-Muhallab calmly responded, and I shall end this with his quotation. I see no point in fighting them since they themselves are fighting each other. If they carry on like this, that is after all what we desire, for therein lies their destruction. Even if they were to unite, they would do so only after they, they had weakened each other out. Then I would take them on when they are weaker and their bravery has dampened, if Almighty God so disposes. Thank you. Okay, um, so as you can see, Nelly has a lot to say, and we have a lot to learn from her. Uh, the, the, what strikes me when when I heard you give that presentation, Nelly, is a uh, is an Al Qaeda recruitment manual that I looked at a couple of years ago, written by a guy named Abu. Am well, that called himself Abu Amr Al Qaeda, and what he was doing was writing a manual for recruiters uh, that would attempt to uh, recruit young Muslims to do jihad, various places in the world. And one of the things that he said is in this manual to his recruiters is you've got to understand your recruits, you need to imbue them with a sense that their loyalty is to God alone, not to the groups that they will go to fight with. Um, and he said that for two reasons. One is he wanted them to maintain their commitment to God, just as you're saying. Uh, but he was also very concerned by the fact that many of these people would be going to Iraq or Afghanistan and they would run into quote unquote jihadis that were not nearly as pure as many of the recruits uh, seemed to think they would be. Um, and this was a major problem in Iraq during 2006, 2007, 2008 uh, for incoming uh, Al Qaeda fighters that were meeting uh, various Iraqi members of the organization and finding that they were just a bunch of thugs rather than uh, true holy warriors. And so I just, it's uh, these grand principles that you've identified, I think, are very uh, concrete in a lot of ways. Um, so my question for you is, is focused on sort of the what do we do element, but um, one, when we think about uh, trends in the modern world that have uh, contributed to sort of a devolution of uh, authority and hierarchy, the internet is one of those. And we often talk about the Al-Qaeda movement, the jihadi movement, devolving authority and influence because of the internet. And I'm wondering how do you think that that interplays with this sort of fundamental ideological dynamic that you've described? Thank you, Ryan. Um, yes, I, I, I appreciate you citing that manual because it, it, it does lend itself to, to, what I'm, to what I'm saying. And, but, but I, I want to go back and emphasize again that, that this loyalty to God we shouldn't just read it as something that is 
it's not just about religion it's not just about faith it is how they would get them not to compromise with any of the political processes that are available out there once they do that they'll become like the islamists like the muslim brotherhood who are going to form political parties and who are going to engage the political process which they think is ultimately going to paralyze jihad and so god really is is something that they can they can use so this way they could be as inclusive as possible but could also exclude any uh, um, non, non-jihadis who don't really get what jihad is about. And, and as you can tell also from, from the forums, which I know that, that, that you follow, um, you know, the, the, the discussions, for instance, in, in Iraq, when, when some of those people who were fighting early on with, with al-Qaeda, uh, um, it, as it used to be called in, in, in Mesopotamia, and they began raising the national uh, 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 the national flag and, and talk about Iraq and so on. Um, this really created a great deal of dissatisfaction within the jihadis, and that that eventually splits because they were really not fighting for Iraq. These these Iraq and, and Syria and Lebanon these are all the Sykes Picot borders that that were imposed on the Muslims by the West, and these are part of the imperialism that continues to, to go on. And, and, and they are part of the reason why they reject their leaders, they reject the nation state. And God, this loyalty to God, is the only thing that could unite them all. And that's really ultimately what allows somebody from Afghanistan to share something with somebody in Iowa uh, um, behind the, you know, on the internet. As to the question of the internet, again, um, it's 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 part of it's it's great and it's uh, and it's also detrimental for the jihadis. It's it's great because it allows them to spread their message, and and uh, and why wouldn't it? It's it's a great means of communication, and that's how they're actually. Um, it's 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 one of their most useful tool, you know, for their leaders, for everybody to be reading their texts, and for people like me to be reading their texts <laughs> and studying them. Um, but at the same time, it's also spreading an ideology that's not necessarily the one that Azam had in mind or even for that matter whether Al-Zawahiri or, or Bin Laden have in mind. So when everybody gets to go on the forum and give everybody gets to write something and post it on the internet and raise the flag of jihad, then you're opening, out, opening it up for street jihadis and, and, and people who don't know what they are talking about and it becomes so it's both the strength as well as as well as the weakness okay let's go to to questions and why don't we start with here yeah. <laughs> hold on wait, wait, wait for the mic Gee, got my questions um, first question are the Kharijites the heirs of the Hashashim second question you're shaking your head no already <laughs> Second question, we don't have the luxury of the time to wait for the Jahidis to turn them, tear themselves apart. So what do we do in the interim? And third question is, the reason that they have not become actively involved in the war against Israel is because Israel is a state. And this is actually a question. And therefore, they are not as interested in its fate as Hamas or Hezbollah. Thank you. That's actually a question. Thank you. So three questions. N- no, the 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 Harishites are not the as uh, of the assassins. The assassins came much later, uh, and they were an offshoot of Shiism. The Harishites emerged before even the sects in Islam came to be consolidated. Uh, um, and 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 the Harishites are really very very principled. The and and they. You know, they, they work on individuals. The, the assassins, they're more tied to lineages and, uh, and, and it's a completely different sense of, 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 uh, 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 of, ideolo- uh, of ideology and, 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 and the way they were, they were driven by that. Um, in terms of the luxury of time, well, I, as I said, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel that I'm always qualified to say what we, what we should be doing. Um, but it, it, that, that's, that's because I, I, I only have, I have the luxury to read text and analyze them. So, uh, um, but it, to give a 
personal opinion. Nothing, nothing that, that it, it's no advice in any way. Sometimes doing nothing could be more profitable than doing something that is harmful. And, and I think when we know if, if we have intel, intelligence on people that could be doing harm to, to themselves and to each other, I think it pays to stand up, to stand aside and watch. If 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 this is how realism works and and how 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 policy works, um, uh, uh, jihad in Israel, I think here the jihadis, um, it, it's interesting they are the more consistent as far as Israel is concerned because they don't see Israel in any way to be uh, uh, more different than than the other re Arab regimes. They find they of course they don't like Israel. But they despise Israel no more than they despise Mubarak and the others. As far as they're concerned, Hamas was a real problem for them because they, you know, initially they they thought that you know Hamas could could continue with the jihad. But but when when Hamas made it really clear that it is a Palestinian-based group, and when Hamas especially took part in the uh, um, electoral process, they were furious. Uh, Al Zawahiri uh, uh, sent several messages. Osama bin Laden sent several messages saying, "You violated God's law," and so on. So I think Israel is really not nothing special for the jihadis. No more so than their 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 um, their concern about Israel is just as problematic as their concern about other Arab states. Okay, Eli, why don't we start? We'll go up to the front and sort of work our way work our way back. Um, Al Milliken, AM Media. What do you see as the effect when other Muslims and those that the jihadis would identify as uh, infidels, crusaders, uh, and or uh, pagans, claiming that they are not really Muslim? And then on the other hand, when those actually refuse to acknowledge that they are Muslim, they're not denying it perhaps, but just refusing to make that distinction. I mean, how do you see that playing out, you know, with, throughout the world? Yeah. And particularly, I guess, in the Muslim world. Um, okay. I, I think um, it, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I deal with some of that in, in, in the book. Um, and I think we must distinguish between those Muslims, Muslims who are denouncing the jihadis um, because they are writing for the West and between those Muslims who are denouncing the jihadis because they are writing for the Muslim people. And there is a clear difference between the discourse that happens in the Arab world, and I'm sorry I don't have other, I, I'm an Arabist, but I don't, I don't have the, the languages of, of, of uh, Indone uh, Bahasa, Indonesia, or Urdu to, to be able to speak on other parts of the world, but I can speak about the discourse in the Arab world. When, when Muslims speak, denounce jihadis, and say these are, this is not what, what Islam is about, and so on, they're speaking most often uh, um, to, you know, because they worry about what is happening on their own streets and their own homes. And, and I do think that this, this discourse is credible because they are speaking uh, from a Muslim land to a Muslim audience. They're not interested in impressing the West. And I take it to be sincere. I'm not saying that all the discourse that happens is in the West is insincere, but I find that I come across people writing uh, denouncing the jihadis because they are writing to a to a to a Western audience, and these come across as people who need to. They're you know I it, it, it's a bit of a dilemma for Muslims who are being looked at because they are Muslims, and I think that's part of that's part of the problem. And 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 you feel that you get this discourse that is not necessarily. Uh, um, not necessarily sincere. It's more bordering on the apologetics, and I think that has to do with the fact that that we treated 9/11 as if it's a problem of Islam, and this has really led many many people from the within the Muslim community. Sometimes they're saying the right things, but other times you feel that they are more on the apologist side. Um, I hope that I that I addressed. 
or I, it looks like I did not. <laughs> do you, you wish, do you wish to add something? Well, I mean, even, you know, I'm just in this country, you know, I mean, there's significant, uh, it seems like the Obama administration in particular is making a point not to acknowledge the Islam of, of the jihadists. Uh, and I mean, and particularly, you know, me, uh, you know, there's many in very serious opposition to that. And I'm curious, uh, do you take sides in that? <laughs> I, unfortunately, it is too late because it's gotten out of the hand of, of the mainstream discourse. I, I, I am not somebody who thinks that the jihadis are un-Islamic. I just don't think that they are, um, that, that they are representative of all of Islam. Uh, but I, I don't think that they are. They, they are. they are interested in one specific component of the Islamic tradition, the militancy. Islam is a great civilization and used to be a great empire. And as such, like all other great civilizations and empires, it had a militant component, just as we have... Uh, uh, just as we have uh, uh, a standing army here. So when you look at these great civilizations, they have a militant component. The jihadis are interested in emphasizing that military component, that militant corpus, and they use it. It is part of that tradition. So I don't think that they are un-Islamic. Um, I, I just think that, that they're not... Uh, mainstream Muslims are more pragmatic about their religion, just as mainstream uh, uh, Christians are. But I think any religion, if you want to take it to the letter, you'll you'll end up finding, you know, finding any any surplus of religion ends up being a deficit of, of religion. So I think, I, I don't think that, that this should be, uh, uh, um, should be exaggerated more than, than it actually is. Okay. You have back there in the on the right, yeah. My name is Alexis Sapchenko, and I represent here myself. One quick comment and one quick question. A uh, comment. I believe that what you said today was very interesting, but there was I heard another reason why jihad is, is eventually doomed and is going to demise, mostly because it is based on negation. It doesn't offer anything. It is based on negation of what was achieved since seventh century. And so far, no, there was no successful movement, no successful force based on negation uh, without proposing anything new. And the quick question, uh, unfortunately, I'm supposed to go back to what was already raised here, is the time frame of this demise. And I know that you cannot answer it, but are we talking about 10, 20 years, or we're we talking about two, three, four generations? Thank you. Uh, you're absolutely correct about your comment on the negation, and in fact, um, I conclude the book by saying that their chances of securing a life in paradise is much greater than achieving any political objectives in this world. Um, yes, they've got nothing to offer. However, however, that doesn't mean that their presence is not necessarily uh, disruptive and dangerous. Um, time frame. Well, I think, uh, uh, I think, the time frame has to depend on on the policies that um, uh, 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 on on the broader policies around them. Do we do we uh, Abu Musa? Let me be specific. Abu Musa al Suri would love it if we have open front warfare.s He'd love an invasion of Syria to get to get more recruiters from outside uh, to go in. The, I think. Uh, 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 you know what, what would be on the table now to speak about possibilities Somalia Yemen invading these countries would really create a a, a, a wonderful a, a wonderful uh, um, potential for the jihadis to grow but I think if they are concentrated in a place and and they and and they have to face their, each other and come up with solutions. They'll, you'll find that they will have plenty to disagree about, especially about religious doctrine. And they would go after themselves before their enemies go after them. So no time frame, I'm afraid. I mean, they could. I I, I wish I could I, I could give you. I think I think you know people who do policy need to weigh carefully um, how they could shorten 
their you know their longevity rather than extend it. I tell you what, the the, the Harishites benefited from two civil wars in the seventh century that were unleashed not by them by somebody else, and they wouldn't have survived as long as they did had it not been for these civil wars that that gave them the opportunity to fight. Okay, Eli. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Leon Weinshaw, University of Wisconsin, Washington, semester in international affairs. I think. Most of us have moved beyond the initial look of the Huntington thesis of a clash between civilizations, recognizing the clash within civilization of Islam. You had mentioned the uh, a jihadi emphasis on individual interpretations and uh, authorization to shed the blood of others. It seems from what we've been seeing in, in, with these kind of attacks in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in uh, uh, Pakistan against fellow Muslims, it seems this can easily degenerate into a form of vigilantism. And I'm wondering, will we expect to see, or should we expect to see, any authoritative voices in the Islamic world? And I don't know what those are, whether it's Al-Azhar University or some other authoritative voices saying, enough of this. This, this is deteriorated into vigilantism. You're, you're settling scores. And this has little, if anything, to do with uh, repelling the Americans or the Christians or anything else. It's, it's, it's a scandal. Thank you. Mainstream religious authorities have been denouncing the jihadis uh, um, as early as the 80s. And they've denounced them on the basis of religion and on the basis of the fact that they believe them to be violating Islamic teachings and this is the way to go. These have been happening throughout. Um, the issue is that the jihadis have already discredited these religious authorities. They say that they are working; they are part of the political establishment. In their own eyes, they don't. They don't have any credibility. They are part of the the establishment. So, as far as they're concerned, they could they could go on denouncing the jihadis as much as they like. That's not. I mean, the people who are fight who are joining the jihadis. Uh, um, again, this is not about whether religion or not. They are fighting the jihadis because they they reject the religious authorities as well as the political process. So these voices are happening. They, Karadawi every every second day he comes up on Al Jazeera and 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 make and make these statements. Al Azhar uh, uh, has written several treatises denouncing uh, um, denouncing. Uh, 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 the jihadis. It's uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is denouncing the jihadis. So it's not as if for lack of denouncing the jihadis, they're happening. But I do think also that that you know I think when we think about this, we we probably think that it's probably because of Islam and we need a religious authority. But I think if you are in Egypt and and you are oppressed and and you are tortured, if you are put in prison. You know, these these voices of religious scholars do not make sense and Al Zawahiri's voice may be way more appealing and and, and may provide a potential solution that, that that these people do not think is forthcoming from the political establishment or the religious establishment. Okay. Dave Rickers, uh, Cato Institute. Uh, I'm really glad you brought up the difference between uh, uh, jihadis and Islamists, uh, and like to talk about the difference between Iraq and Afghanistan. And you clearly make the point that the uh, Sunni sectarian and nationalist militias, their insurgent allies, kind of spelled the end of AQI once the political differences became clear. Um, how does that contrast with Afghanistan? Because the militias there are also tribal, but uh, and with a history of fundamentalist thought, but they have a lack of a state history. Uh, parallel to Iraq and maybe more Pashtunistan in certain areas than Afghanistan and they're active and the uh, more extreme elements are displacing tribal leadership and actually tribal law and I'm glad you mentioned law because what used to be ad hoc courts of equity sort of dispute resolution is being replaced with courts of Islamic law so how does Afghanistan come out is it more do you think it's more likely to trend jihadist caliphate or will it devolve into tribal or national Islamism and how does our presence help or hinder that uh, glide path? Thank you. Um, that allows me to talk about, I, I can only address one component of, of your question. I'm not, I'm not a, an Afghan 
uh, um, a scholar, but I can tell you from um, the the readings that I've done by by jihadi texts about Afghanistan, early on when the Taliban uh, um, emerged, there was a significant tension amongst jihadis as to whether it is lawful to fight alongside the Taliban. And these these concerns were raised because they thought that the Taliban were kubori yun, or they perform idol worship on cemeteries, that they adopted some Sufi or mystical versions of Islam, and they began denouncing the Taliban. At that time, the jihadi leadership and the strategic leadership, they were furious about this and saying, well, they've, they've really given us uh, um, this, this, uh, this opportunity to, to have a base here in Afghanistan. And there was a serious tension amongst the jihadis, including Abu Musab al-Suri, who is a leading strategist, having to write a treatise denouncing these jihadis and saying, well, that's really not my problem with the Taliban. My problem is that they want to be part of the United Nations. My problem is... Uh, um, they want they want to raise flags and having embassies in 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 Afghanistan, which goes against the sort of creed of the jihadis because they're not part of the nation state. They don't want to be part of. They reject this this world order. Um, I, I think uh, um, it, it, there would have been a, a potential for these differences uh, uh, to be. Uh, uh, to be explosive in Afghanistan. Uh, um, and at the moment, from you, what we can tell is that, and look, I'm no, I'm no expert again, but, but it seems that the Taliban are going more global uh, uh, and possibly getting closer to the jihadis than, than they were in, in 2001. So... Um, Maybe, maybe invading Afghanistan was not probably. It, maybe if 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 the invasion of Afghanistan did not did not happen, there would have been uh, um, some possibilities for for the jihadis to find um, to find differences with the Taliban. And and I'll I'll say something a little bit to that effect. I was reading uh, Ben Uthman, who used to be a Liban a Libyan Afghan. In, in in Afghanistan he was he's giving an interview to a to an Arabic newspaper and he claims that the Taliban gave a um, couple of warnings to the United States that an attack is being prepared from Afghanistan against the United States they didn't know what it was but it seems that Mullah Omar at the time was furious with what was happening uh, uh, on Afghani land so uh, um, I think there were many differences brewing. I don't know where the status of these differences are at the moment. I think um, I just want to mention one thing that I probably should have mentioned at the outset, which is that Nellie works up at West Point, but obviously she doesn't speak for the U.S. government or West Point or anything like that on this. Absolutely, uh, yeah. yes. Um, the, uh, I, I have a question <laughs> for you, um, and before we go to the next one, which is that I. I there, there is a literature in the sort of counterterrorism jihadi studies world um, that suggests that the jihadi world is split between what Brynjar Lea calls strategists and doctrinarians. Brynjar Lea is a researcher in, in Norway. Um, and and Brynjar points to Abu Musab al-Suri and says, well, he is a strategist precisely because he was willing to cut deals and work with the Taliban and work with groups that perhaps didn't uh, fit the sort of letter of jihadi sort of uprightness right. the way that others might have. Um, whereas you've got doctrinarians, and, and he points to Abu Qatada uh, in London, who uh, condoned uh, brutal, uh, brutal sort of um, massacres in Algeria on behalf of jihadist thought. And so I'm wondering what you think about this division that, that Leah identifies and whether this exists and how does it interplay with the, the dynamics that you're discussing? Thank you. I fully agree uh, um, with, with this division and I, and I mentioned some of that in the book and I, and I do think that not all jihadis are actually uh, uh, doctrinally driven. On the contrary, the starting point is a very strategic point and it's a very clever rationalization of how they could uh, um, uh, 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 how they could actually um, 
get back at their own governments by by resorting to a doctrinal paradigm. So the doctrinal paradigm is a even though it is anti political, it is not apolitical. And yes, as I said, it is it gives them a source of uh, uh, legitimacy that is outside the other forms of legitimacies that they don't want to be part of. And and this has been happening for a very long time and and I think uh, um, again, Abu Musab al Suri had written a treatise against, um, in which he criticized, as, as you noted, Abu Qtada al Palestini. And he also was also furious with, with some of the Algerians who were working with bin Laden at some point. And they had denounced these, these uh, uh, Algerians had actually denounced bin Laden. And they declared takfir against him at one point. And bin Laden was furious. So these, these are. It's only if we know how to manipulate them, and I don't think that we've been very successful at that. But they exist, and they are there for, for, uh, um, for the prudent and shrewd policy makers to work with them. Okay. Other questions back there? Yeah. Hi, I'm Hamid Kardar from CSIS. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on sort of the factors that led to the Abadia um, sort of reneging on the the um, strict doctrinal um, uh, tech theory thing, and, and, and what signs we can look for going forward. That, given what you were just saying about how it's a anti-political, not apolitical, and there's sort of strategic calculus in choosing the doctrinal. Um, a, a strictly doctrinal approach, uh, if, if there would be a shift away from that um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the Ibadia, which is the only um, Kharijite group that has survived, um, they decided that uh, um, they did not want to meet the same fate as as the Azarika and various other militant Kharijites. They saw how they were actually dividing against themselves and how they ended up turning against each other. B before the end of the seventh century, they disappeared. What the Ibadiya did is that it wanted to maintain its uh, sort of religious worldview. They did not renege on uh, uh, their worldview that they did not believe that the third and the fourth caliphs were um, had made a mistake. And they continued to want to identify with the early Kharijites and decided to go underground. And they did various other, I mean, when you go underground, you also uh, um, decide that, that your options are, are different. And what they ended up doing in order to survive, they believed in several imamates that you didn't need just one imam. So they, they had various other imams who were, uh, um, who were uh, um, you know, appointed in various parts of, of Arabia. And um, and they decided and they decided that they were going to cooperate with other fellow Muslims in order to maintain their beliefs without without going there. So they 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 really um, stopped um, that rigid worldview and and militant worldview of the other militant Kharijites. They wanted their beliefs. They wanted their stance to continue. Um, and and just to to be fair here, not all the Kharijites that started at the beginning were militant, but some of them ended up taking it into a militancy, and which which led to their demise. How can we look at signs uh, um, today? Um, I think I think it's um, I think we shouldn't be misled, for instance by the recantations that we hear about, about jihadis. What I do think is, is happening is that when we have voices critical of the jihadis by jihadis who continue to be on the battlefield, I think these would be interesting. I'm working currently on a, on a biography by Fadel Harun, who is from the Comoros Islands, and, uh, and he's somebody, uh, um, who is believed to be a leading operative of Al-Qaeda in East Africa, and he was the second planner of the 1998 bombings. And Fadil Harun is still a jihadi, active in jihad, raises the flag of Al-Qaeda, but is very, very concerned about the takfiri trends. And his, he presents an ideology of Al-Qaeda that's much more pragmatic than 
uh, um, than than we have come to to understand about Al Qaeda. Now, if all of them now I'm I'm saying this, but if but if all of them think like Fad al Harun, I think they're going to be really powerful. But I don't think that they that that I think he worries that there aren't many people who are as strategic and pragmatic as he is in terms of his understanding of Islam. So I think the signs are when when some of them are, are either going to continue to fight and they're going to turn against each other, or that some of them who are going to say mea culpa, but not in prisons being made to say so in, in, uh, um, and being written by somebody in official in the Egyptian government as they did with Dr. Fadl um, and others. Do we have any other questions out there? Okay. Here, why don't you use this one? Um, I was curious, uh, with your interpretation, h how do you see Spain and the history there and uh, the political dynamics, I mean, going back to the uh, Crusades, uh, aren't jihadis universally uh, opposed to Islam losing control over that region of the world? Uh, and I mean, how do they justify? How do you see the justification, you know, of their denial of political uh, necessity? Uh, um, in terms of in terms of Spain, I don't think that this is their focus on at the moment. I think they're more interested in what's happening in 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 the Islamic world at the moment, and what is really specifically related. Uh, uh, to Muslims now, in theory, in th in theory, in theory, when if if they can if they can bring about this unity, they will reclaim Spain. They would, in theory, in principle, they want to reclaim all the land, the territory of Islam, but they don't have a program. I mean, they can't even they can they can't even get even one of the states in the Islamic world. So in theory, yes, you can say they want to reclaim Spain, but their focus is really not so much on Spain. When they attacked Spain, they attacked it because it was present in Iraq. It wasn't so much because they wanted to institute a Sharia government in Spain. Um, in terms of negating the political, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's detrimental to them, but at the same time, it's really what got them where they are. If you know they otherwise there would be the Muslim Brotherhood contesting elections and they wouldn't be able to do what they think. Now I mean the the, the Muslim Brotherhood seems to be I mean the, the, the elections in the past week have, have shown that that maybe they're not getting anywhere in terms of in terms of advancing. Uh, their agenda through the political process. And the jihadis would, are, are going to be pointing at this, definitely. Uh, um, and they have done so in the past. Um, so, yes, they are negating the political process, but that's what really makes them, m allows them to have the profile that they do. Um, the question is, are they going to achieve anything? That they won't. I mean, it's they can they can seek revenge. They could be disruptive. Um a great deal of things, but they're not going to be able to achieve anything tangible that they want to be able to achieve in terms of an entity. Okay, any final questions? Oh, yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, this is just a short one. I thought I heard you say that referring to the attack of 9-11, it was not a religious attack or not a jihadi attack. I wonder... I may have misinterpreted, but I'd like to, if you could expand a little bit on, on, on what you meant. Um, it, it was certainly a jihadi attack. Um, no, but perhaps you might have heard me talking about the Taliban having warned the Americans at the time, wanting to warn the Americans that there was an attack being prepared against the United States from Afghan soil by Al-Qaeda, but they didn't know what it was. Um, is it a religious attack? Well, um, in, 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 in so far as Al-Qaeda has adopted a religious paradigm, it is. 
But bin Laden is very clear, you know, in his statements to the American public, he says, um, your government and our governments are one and the same. Our attacks, our, our fight against against uh, our government is not separate from our fight against you. So in many respects, you find that what is happening on Western soil is not separate from what is happening on Muslim soil. And indeed, it, it's, it's, uh, you, can, you can argue that, that attacks happening on Western soil are part of the war against Muslim regimes. They can't do it there because of the policing state, etc. Uh, they, they do when they can. Um, but if they can't do it there, they come to Western soil and, and say, this is our fight because, because they, they believe that, that their regimes would not survive had it not been for the support of the United States and its allies. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, I think we'll call it there. Uh, before I let you go, I'm going to do just a hint of self-promotion. I'll be here on Thursday with one of Nelly's colleagues, Asaf Mogadam, uh, for the uh, launch of a report that we've just completed that's going to be coming out from the Combating Terrorism Center up at West Point, hitting on many of these same themes. Um, so I'll hope, hopefully we'll see you again. And Nelly, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you very much.